Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning, uh, or good evening, in fact, uh, and welcome to the, the COBIS webinar. Uh, my name is Colin, Colin Be Bell, and I'm the CEO of Afternoon in sunny London, um, and also uh, a bit of information in terms of the COBIS response as well. So I'd like to provide a, a short introduction, uh, three minutes or so, and then we'll hand over to Brian, Brian Cooklin, uh, Principal of North Anglia International School, Hong Kong. Brian will take us through some excellent uh, learning and slides and experience for about 30 minutes, and then we will field some questions from colleagues uh, gathered around the world. And the questions will last about 10 minutes or so, so please do go to the question section that you can access and, and type away any thoughts, feelings as well. So uh, just to, to let you know that obviously COBIS is a very proactive and responsive association. And in relation to this global situation connected to COVID-19, we do recognize that there are current challenges, potential challenges connected to the situation we find ourselves in globally. And uh, just to reiterate, we are committed to supporting your schools around the world as they face these challenges head on. So gathered this today on this webinar, we've got over 300 registered participants from over 55 countries. Every continent's represented. Again, that's reflective of COBIS. So colleagues from China, Japan, Nepal, Mongolia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Uganda, Laos, Kenya, Italy, Ghana, Nigeria, Mexico, USA, the list goes on. Um, we recognize that there are current closures in China, Hong Kong, UAE, Qatar, Saudi, Ukraine, Romania, Czech Republic, Italy, France, parts of Spain. These are unprecedented times and you know we, we will share information as we go along um, to respond best we can to, to you, our schools. So disruption has certainly played its part within the COBIS uh, activities, whether it's our planned accreditation visits so we've postponed a number of accreditation visits whether it's residential student events and competitions and of course our provision for a whole school workforce CPD courses now as you'll appreciate life is about partnership success is about partnership so we continue to work closely with our host schools participating schools as we continue to monitor and make decisions about the viability of uh, courses or events or conferences uh, with schools and stakeholders um, within locations around the world. So in, in light of the developments around the world, uh, I, I'm really pleased to share with you that we have now created a support hub on our website which is designated to COVID-19 uh, and the work that you're doing uh, um, to, to support your international school communities. So this support hub is a resource for schools full of advice, guidance, case studies, resources, how to deal with school closures uh, and other impact um, in relation to COVID-19. And it comes this guidance from trusted sources from all over the world, uh, including also signposting to WHO, F WHO, FCO, here in the UK, Department of Education and more. So we're looking for people to contribute, whether it's continuity of education, developing online learning, delivering effective communications, uh, supporting the well-being of school communities, reducing the impact, and also the spread of misinformation. That's a, a key point as well. So in terms of first-hand experience, uh, we also recognize in addition to our schools, we have experts in the fields from our supporting members, and they've also offered um, access to their resources, many of which is free at this, uh, this, this challenging time. But ladies and gents, we've also created a LinkedIn group, which is designated uh, for uh, our network. It's principally for COBIS members, but look, we're a highly inclusive organization. We believe unity and diversity, and you know, our education community is, is wholeheartedly stronger together. So this uh, LinkedIn group network is open to, to all uh, who wish to contribute. Um, so, Brian, we've got Brian who's going to lead us through uh, our next uh, half hour or so. 
Brian is obviously principal of Nord Anglia International School Hong Kong. He's also, we're delighted, uh, a, a much valued member of the COBIS board. Uh, Brian has 40 years experience uh, plus, four, 23 years as a school principal, whether that's in UK, Mexico, founding principal over there in Hong Kong. Uh, but Brian has also been board member of, of um, uh, UCAS. Also, he's worked in working parties for Scottish and uh, the UK government too, and president of the Head Teacher Association of Scotland. So, North Anglia, uh, sorry, Brian's from the North Anglia Schools Group. Uh, a little later on, when we when we bring this uh, webinar to a conclusion, I'd like to share with you some of the the global response from the North Anglia network, which has got over uh, well 66 schools in 29 countries. Um, it's a remarkable network, 600, sorry, 65,000 students uh, and roughly 14,000 staff. So I'll share with you later a little bit about the global response, which has been provided by um, our colleague Andy Puttock, Director of Education for Nord Anglia. So, Brian, without further ado, it's a great pleasure to introduce you, to welcome you to all our colleagues who are tuned in from around the world. And uh, the, the floor is yours for the next, uh, say, 30 minutes. So, Brian, thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Colin. And hello to everyone from Hong Kong, wherever you are in the world. And can I just say, for those of you facing a situation that we faced with the threat of closure from the virus, good luck. And I hope that this presentation can give you some help uh, and save you some time, if possible, in the midst of all of this. So. The reason that I chose the title, Making a Virtue Out of a Necessity, is that online learning has been going on for some time, for many years, in one form or another, and some people are very adept at it. But in terms of how we uh, can deliver online learning during a closure, that's really been forced upon us. And because we had to do it at short notice, it really made us question and constantly look at what can we do that will give children the best opportunity in this difficult situation. So to begin with, uh, you'll see on this page, and a copy of this uh, webinar uh, will be provided by Cobus on the Knowledge Hub, so you'll have access to this. But if you either use the QR code or click on the word Padlet, it will open up a live page which people can add uh, resources to. And what you'll see are things that we have used and created. Uh, feel perfectly free to use any of them if it's of help to you. Resources for teachers, for example, is including from a colleague, Seth Fisher, the uh, online training that he's offered for a number of years. So there's an online training package for staff who haven't done it before. There are the platforms that we've used uh, that have been extremely helpful for us in delivering online learning. And there are resources for leaders. There's an e-safety conduct code of conduct, which uh, quite happy for you to use any of this material, cut and paste, if it helps you get through this crisis. And you'll see some other advice about well-being and other matters. So that's all included in the paddle. That's probably the most important section of this presentation, because hopefully it gives everyone something concrete that they can use. But there's also live, so. For those of you who are already working in this area because your schools are closed, then feel free to add anything to it because it means everyone can share resources and ideas, uh, which I think is the most important thing to do in this critical situation. The issues to be faced I've listed here, uh, and the first one is making sure that staff are ready to deal with this and giving staff training because we will all be in this, the position where staff have varying degrees of knowledge, understanding, capacity in this area, and it's very important they feel supported. It's equally important that we pitch. I mean, this is very like a normal lesson. You have to get the pace and the pitch right, so you need to make sure that you're providing the materials for all ages. In our school, it's uh, age 3 to 18 we're covering, so we promised and we've delivered online learning for all age groups, but I wouldn't pretend that it's easy, and I'm certainly not pretending we've got all the answers. I'll also have a look at the teaching and learning strategies we've been using that we've found have been helpful. 
Um, I'll refer to the access to technology, because again, that's going to be different in different countries and different schools. Uh, and I think also very importantly to look at the question of safeguarding, e-safety and well-being of all. And the last point I'll be covering is about communications, uh, because while we're so busy trying to deliver the online learning, it's quite easy to forget the importance of communications. And that really is top of the list in order to make this function and work properly. When it comes to staff preparation and training, uh, we had a slight advantage, we didn't know it at the time, but because the school was closed during Hong Kong protest situations for a week, we then after that uh, decided to evaluate what we do in the event of a further closure. We didn't for one moment think we were going to be closed for months as we are just now, um, but it has stood us in good stead because we had training for staff about online learning, about the different options, looking at the platforms we already used and making people aware of different possibilities. So that made for a quicker start. So if your area or your country is not yet threatened with closure, my advice would be to get as much training done with staff as you possibly can on any of the packages you're already using. Because if certain teachers are using them, then they will be able to be champions and they will be able to support staff who are less confident or who have never used these materials. Some of the companies have offered free access uh, and throughout the period of closure have offered uh, materials. And they've also offered the chance to have training on how to use their particular platform or tools. And that's, in addition, a great support for staff. I think the key for us throughout this is to be flexible and adaptable. We didn't decide to do one thing and stick to it. We constantly had surveys of staff, students, parents, any comments on this week's learning, any comments on what we've changed or what we've done. Is it better? Is it worse? Is there something else we should be doing? You will, of course, know that in teaching, everyone's an expert. Uh, and by that, I'm talking about parents, external agencies, everybody knows. And of course, it's one of those jobs where sometimes people think they know better than you do. And you have to take that on board and you have to look at what they're suggesting because they may be right. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is to make sure that what you're offering works for every child to the best of your ability. And the last point is to ensure that in the midst of all of this, try and make as much time available for teams to come together and plan what they're doing next, because that's going to make it run much more smoothly uh, than it might otherwise do if you don't make that allowance for time. If you look at what we're doing with each section of the school, in early years, we are delivering in our school the English national curriculum, starting with the foundation level early years. So this is entirely focused on learning through play. So major difficulties you encounter is that parents don't understand what that means. They think it's just playing, it's not learning. Uh, they also, unfortunately, in a number of instances, uh, have to ask us, how do I play with my child? Or how do I work with my child to develop learning? And this actually happens at all ages. Uh, but it's been interesting that uh, a byproduct of this has actually been teaching some parenting skills as we've gone along. For early years, what we're doing is that teachers are modeling the activities uh, and we're then making them available on our virtual learning environment. It's Firefly that we use, uh, different platforms that people might have. And we also use software. In this case, we use Tapestry, which is a bit like a visual blog it means that the teacher normally, and uh, when schools are open, will film what they've done that day, send it to parents, make comments, ask the parents to comment and feedback, and it's a, a constant exchange. So it's happening the other way around now because what children are doing in their homes, parents are filming, sending to teachers and TLAs, and they feedback and vice versa. In addition to that, we've given parents access to our libraries in each of our campuses, uh, if they run out of reading materials or other materials that they could use, because we're trying to make sure, especially youngest children, have limited screen time. 
because we wouldn't normally in early years be putting them in front of a screen at all or very rarely. So we've included lots of practical activities and um, lots of opportunities to cook or make different sorts of food. Uh, last week they were all making designing their own boat. Um, this week we're issuing a curiosity box which has got lots of ideas of things for them to be curious about and look at that would be around their home or in their immediate environment. And every week we're giving them top tips of how to play and learn. When it comes to primary, it's a different model. Primary parents uh, were concerned about how this was going to work, given that many of them are having to work from home or they're having to go into work and leave their children to be looked after by helpers who may not have the same command of English uh, to actually help the children deal with the tasks. So what we do in that instance, as far as primary is concerned, is that each teacher will post every day various tasks and resources. They'll make a video of it or have a link that parents can open and the resources can all be printed. So if they want to print it off and leave it for children, they can do so. If they want to wait until they're home from work, then they can do that work with the children later. It's entirely up to them, but they wanted that flexibility. Any work that's completed by children can be uploaded so that the teachers can give feedback immediately. So what we found very successful here is to use Microsoft Teams. And we use the chat function so that the teacher and the class or the teacher can talk to an individual child and can communicate about the work they've uploaded or about the work the class having if they want any explanations. So that's been a great way to keep in touch with children. Now we've opted for this model rather than videoing a lesson uh, or delivering it live in that format. And there are various reasons for that. One is it's not the way we teach. So we don't normally have a teacher standing there and just record a lecture and give it to them. Uh, nor would we just have a lesson where that videoing was taking place with no input from children. So we want it to be as interactive as possible. There is also a question of safeguarding as far as videoing is concerned, uh, which can impact both on the children and on the teachers. So it's something to be conscious of. All of our subjects are covered in the primary provision, including a specialist one. So art, music, drama, PE teachers uh, will include materials. It was particularly funny during World Book Day, for example, last week, when the PE staff sent out a video of how you could do your high intensity exercises while reading a book. Uh, it's one I can definitely recommend. When it comes to feedback, again, it's using Microsoft Teams or email to send work or ask questions. The chat functions used and QuickTime is a great way of recording the screen or narrating videos. It's uh, very easy to do on that system, on that package of Microsoft and Office 365. You can also have voice notes or you can have PDFs that you've annotated to point them in the right direction of what they should be looking at and the kind of questions they should be investigating. While this is going on, teachers are online all day in normal teaching hours to answer real-time questions and to give feedback as and when anybody requires it. When it comes to secondary, it's a different model again because we chose to operate with real-time lessons. So we're following the normal daily timetable. So each period is delivered by each class teacher. And the timetable, normally we have 45 minute lessons, but we're allowing 10 minutes for the setup in case there are any technical problems and 25 minutes of connected time. That's where the teacher has provided material or resources uh, and that's where uh, the class, the individuals are able to come back and ask questions uh, through Microsoft Teams, Padlets and, and other methods. So the online discussion boards that we use through Firefly, our VLE platform, allows us to support a number of different um, platforms and pieces of software. And I've got to pay credit to everyone involved in this. When we first started, because so many schools closed at once, Firefly, for example, inundated and their servers were overloaded. And they've been a marvelous company to work with because they immediately increased capacity 
and they've supported us every step of the way as we've added more and more to what we're doing online. So it's really good if you can work with, with a partner like that. When it comes to the discussion boards, I've given you an example of Padlet in that first slide, and that's been very widely used in secondary because it's live. So the teacher can enter the information, the question, the discussion, and the students can join in and you can share each other's screens and everybody can get involved in it. Similarly, uh, with others like Flipgrid and Nearpod, I'll come back to later. In addition to that work set, there are also optional challenge tasks that we give to years seven to nine. So we make sure they're getting something substantial to work on. And we have compulsory challenge tasks for years 10 and up because the major concern are for those certificate and examination groups because they're losing that face-to-face -face teaching, which is a great concern to all of us. We have a policy that marking and feedback for all this work is returned within two lessons. So there's no huge gap or chance of falling behind um, and of course, of not understanding the next stage in the learning. So the QuickTime screen is used for recording the introductions and screenshots then uh, of everything that's happening can take place, whether it's from a teacher or whether it's a class sharing screens. And the beauty of this is if it's done in QuickTime and you've pressed uh, the button, then everything is recorded and it automatically is uploaded onto another part of the Microsoft Teams suite called Streams. The reason we use this is because all of this, the VLE, Firefly, Microsoft Teams, is password protected and encrypted, which makes it much safer. And it means that we can very quickly provide these video recordings of anything that's been shared as work. That's important because it lets the students go back and look at it afterwards if there's anything you couldn't remember or weren't clear on. It's also helpful for people who are in different time zones. We have that issue with about 10% of our role on different parts of the world and therefore they're accessing, it, accessing material at different times of the day. So by doing this, they're not losing out. They can still be involved in the teaching and learning that's going on. So when it comes to the actual strategies, as I've said, Firefly hosts all of the work safely. So that's the first advantage. Parents have their Firefly passwords, students have their password and so do staff. Uh, and therefore they can access what their children are looking at or doing as parents, and they can also access the feedback and everything that uh, teachers are saying about the work that their children are doing. Microsoft Teams, apart from the chat function, which is widely used, also has notebook and assignment functions that can be used. So there's a whole range of things that you can utilize if they're suitable for you. One particular caveat I should say about chat function is that we've deliberately set it up so that the chat group is set up by the teacher alone. So the capacity for the individual child to set up a group chat or to turn the video on has been blocked. And this is to prevent any inappropriate use of it or any waste of time. When it comes to Microsoft's streams, as I've said, it safely records everything that they're doing for later study. The Padlet mirrors the sequence of the classroom learning. It's what we would normally be do, doing in a lesson where we would introduce the material uh, or the resources. We'd set people to different tasks. We'd interact with them. We'd have an exchange of ideas. Um, so it lets us do all of those things. It lets us embed any video or audio content in the work. And it allows us to give instant feedback and praise and say to people, that was a great idea. It's really taking the learning further forward. In the same way, Flipgrid allows collaboration for video. So you'll see some duplication here. And the reason there is duplication is that we wanted to harness what staff already were familiar with and knew. So different departments like different things. And they might do the same kind of job. But as long as somebody is using something that advances a child's learning and progress, I don't care what it is. I don't think it's essential that everyone uses exactly the same thing. I think what's more important is that people get something that actually works. 
So Nearpod, for example, is very much favoured by the maths department because they think it works really well in terms of giving individual targets uh, and being real-time assessment. Uh, and definitely that makes a difference. And the uh, big adventure for us that we were going to embark on this year uh, was we'd already signed up to be involved with Century Tech. And this is a British company that's an artificial intelligence platform. And we've had to bring that work forward. And Century Tech have been great supporters, as you'll see on Cobus's Knowledge Hub, of schools around the world that have been affected by closure. Because again, they're offering free support and free access for as long as the school's closed. It's aligned with the curriculum, that is the English national curriculum, um, GCSEs, IGCSEs, but they are working on materials for IB diploma as well. Um, so it may not necessarily be at the best platform depending on what curriculum you're delivering. But what it does is to fit with the child's learning and immediately give a response about where they've gone wrong, give advice about what they have to look at to get this answer right. So our school has already talked to league apparently with 50,000 questions. You know, I think we're now up to 70,000 questions answered. Uh, and certainly it's a tremendous reinforcement for the learning that is going on anyway. Uh, and the feedback we've got from parents and from our children is tremendous. They very much like this additional support. Of course, this is only possible if you have access to technology. In our school, in primary, we have one-to-one -one iPads issued for children. And if they don't, we have them in school, but if they don't have access at home, then you can borrow them from the school. It's a bring your own device policy in secondary, so all those students have their own devices that have been checked by the school and are compatible and have the requisite and appropriate um, apps and programs logged on. All of the students and parents can access Firefly via password. However, a number of households don't have enough devices. So we may have devices in school, but they don't have them at home. So we have some families with two, three, four children in their school, and they might only have one laptop at home. So trying to share that amongst four children simultaneously is obviously not going to work. So you have practical issues like that to deal with. There are technical issues about internet and Wi-Fi coverage uh, in different areas. It's not as strong as others, depending how remote their house is. If they are in another country at the moment that perhaps doesn't have particularly strong internet or Wi-Fi coverage, or if they're in a country where there are blocks on information you're trying to send them, all of these technical issues are frustrating and they can be difficult to deal with. Uh, we've got over almost all of them, but it's taken time. And I think just alert your IT department and staff about the kind of things they may be getting asked to deal with. Some of them are pretty basic, like please remember to turn the machine on first, but some are much wider than that. And of course, this is all exacerbated if the person isn't in the country. Because I've had to say to staff, try and reduce the amount of time you're spending during the night answering calls from different parts of the world because they forget what the time difference is from where they are and what the time is in Hong Kong. And clearly it's exhausting if you're still trying to support families around the world and get up early in the morning to do your normal job. In the area of safeguarding, then home learning can raise some safeguarding concerns. So video, for example, you can't have operating, and we've had to put in uh, some of these uh, particular items in code of conduct. For example, a child can't be sitting in their pajamas, or for that matter, a teacher, uh, likewise, while conducting a lesson. Um, and it can't be any kind of filming that might identify where the teacher lives, where the child lives. And this is a prob problem with a lot of video platforms because they are open and there's a question of people hacking in or using these images inappropriately. So it can be difficult. The screen time has to be balanced with other activities. It's what I've described as the loneliness of the long distance learner, teacher, parent. If the child's on their own, perhaps with a helper, trying to access this, 
then what's had to happen is a lot of children, including very young children, have had to up their skills and technology very quickly. The same has happened for teachers and, of course, for a number of parents. You can imagine the stress there is in a number of households as the parent is forced to work from home, deal with home life, supervise children of different ages at different levels, accessing different learning on different devices all at the same time. Those of you with your own children might well understand exactly what I'm describing as normal life, but it's exacerbated here in this situation. The uh, positive byproduct is I'm very struck by a number of parents who've contacted me to say, I really appreciate what teachers do, do now in a day because I'm trying to do it with two. I don't know how you manage it with a full class. You do, of course, get the opposite comments as well, but we won't go into those. Communication and interaction during this period is absolutely vital because loneliness, isolation, and the strange feelings it leaves you with, not having that human interaction with your friends at school, with your colleagues, uh, with the people you normally work with, is all detrimental to people's health and well-being. So it's very important that that is borne in mind while this system is in operation. So what we have are regular check-ins from staff. Well, first, for staff themselves, every morning uh, we have Microsoft Teams chats. Uh, we also bring staff into schools. So although it's closed for uh, parents and for children to access, it's open for staff. So myself and the senior staff and many other members of staff are in the school full time. Um, so we can see each other and we can meet and plan. Uh, and for the staff who are working from home uh, and from the children working from home, it's important there's that human contact. So we have regular check-ins and to make sure that there are no pastoral issues to deal with because teenagers in particular will have a high level of angst and especially those who are facing exams soon. We have counselling available for staff and pupils and psychologists online. And we also provide advice for parents uh, offline who are concerned themselves about their own well-being and how they're coping. So I think it's important to put these steps in place if you possibly can. In terms of e-safety, you will find on the Padlet our um, NAIS Hong Kong e-citizenship code of conduct. We've tried to keep it as simple and straightforward as possible, and it refers to things like e-kindness and e-respect. And as I said earlier, you're quite happy. We're quite happy for you to make use of that as you see fit. There are also protocols for distance learning because we need to lay down these guidelines of exactly how it has to operate and what needs to be done and protocols for video recording and communication. These are absolutely essential because it would just be the same as the kind of standards and the quality assurance you would have for teaching and learning going on if the school was open. And the last main area is communications. It's absolutely critical that you keep talking to parents, pupils, staff, and the wider world about what you're doing, asking their opinion, and valuing that opinion by amending what you're offering. So with that in mind, we kept getting a lot of the same questions. So we had to quickly amend and develop our frequently asked question lists. Now, you won't be surprised to know that as a principal, what I get most of are the complaints in terms of why do I have to pay any fees because they're not at school? Why Certainly, why do I have to pay bus fees? Why isn't this happening? And this other school's doing it a different way. Why aren't you doing it that way? So it does. it's worth your while to try and head some of these off and think about how you're going to respond. To put it bluntly, when I've said to parents, well, if you don't think you should be paying tuition fees, then obviously we're not going to be able to keep staff. And when your child returns to school, there won't be any teacher for your child to teach them. That's a pretty blunt way of putting it, but it usually gets through uh, quicker than multiple emails. Likewise, we've been able to negotiate discounts for bus fees, etc. but it all depends on the situation in your school and in your country and how that operates. You need to be very active uh, in communicating with the outside world, particularly in social media. 
So those of you who are on LinkedIn with me, for example, will have seen that I share a lot of posts of the work that children have been doing so that people can get a clear idea of what's going on and the kind of things that are possible that children can do with home learning and sharing it with others. So this is a very good way of advertising what your school's doing because there will be people who think you're doing nothing and teachers are lazy and you're sitting back collecting the money and you're certainly not doing anything to teach my child. So it's important that you show everyone, including those who are not at your school, exactly what is operating in practice. You also have to bear in mind that everything we're doing is governed by the laws and regulations of the country you're in, of your safeguarding policies and procedures, of privacy uh, ordinances, regulations and laws. And of course, if you're in Europe or outside of Europe, still affected by GDPR about, again, data protection. So that doesn't go away. And if anything, uh, it could be more dangerous if you don't remember to follow it when you come uh, to those situations online. So finally then, it's a repeat of that Padlet. Uh, and you get the opportunity to ask any questions. You will see when uh, you have you have it on screen, but you will see it uh, if you get a copy of this, that I've given you my email address. If you think of questions afterwards, no matter what they are, feel free to send me them. I can't guarantee to the answers to all of them, but I'll do my level best to respond. And as I said at the beginning, I wish you every success in this venture, because it's certainly not an easy time for any of us to be operating. But we just together, I think, can help each other to do the best we can by the children we serve. I'll hand you back to Colin, who I think will have some of the questions ready. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, well, you know, again, on behalf of everyone who's tuned in, you've given us a huge amount there to, to uh, consider whether it's safeguarding, code of conduct, screen time, communication with parents. Uh, the use of your online discussion boards, marking, feedback, uh, and also the frustrations of, uh, of gaining access to um, IT for, for students and colleagues, students in particular, families who are not based uh, within Hong Kong itself. So uh, we, we've got a question, we've got a number of questions, but first and foremost, in terms of um, any changes to the timetable, and the overall timetable of the school, not just necessarily of individual lessons, but any learnings that you can share with us on that front, please, Brian? Yes, well, we were quite keen to replicate the existing timetable as much as possible, because what we're trying to do in this very ab abnormal situation is make it as normal as we can. So in secondary, it's made a difference for students to be able to have their teacher connected to them at the time they would normally be with their teacher. So even although that's difficult for some subjects like PE, for example, every single subject has stepped up to the plate and delivered a lesson uh, that can be done at home and given uh, different activities and suggestions of what they could do. So we haven't changed the timetable at all as far as secondary is concerned. In primary, we've amended it in that we have varied tasks, but in the midst of that, we haven't just concentrated on English, maths, core subjects. We have made sure that every week, every child has at least one art activity, one drama activity, one music activity, one sporting activity, because it's that variety that's important for them uh, in the midst of this home learning. As far as early years is concerned, well, that's very different because clearly we can't do what we normally do where everything, all the resources are prepared in class by the teacher to follow the unique interests of each individual child. And you can't do that the same way online. So I would say that's probably the biggest departure timetable wise. But I've been amazed at uh, the high standard, uh, at the quality, the initiative, the innovation that uh, staff have been able to display in trying to respond to these particular problems. Thank you, Brian. Um, another question is in terms of uh, do students need their own email to, which is set up by the school? Uh, what's, what's your experience on that from? Well, yes, we do. Uh, we start with that. Every child uh, in the school is given an email address 
um, along with the staff. So everyone has that. In our case, it's .nais.hk it will end with. So everyone okay. has a dedicated one, and certainly that makes life easier. The problem with other email addresses uh, is they are personal or private, and then there's the possible access issues again. So we always say, uh, use the email address that you're given by the school. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the frequency of your communication with parents, members of the school community, what have you learned from, from that in terms of information giving, depth, frequency, please? Yes, well, again, we try to keep it normal. So we send a parent update every week when schools open. So we're still doing that now. So the parent update goes out every week. Every day there's blog on our um, Facebook page. We have, uh, well, everything in social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. We have information going out every day. Uh, it just depends on how much information and what we're choosing to share. Uh, the senior leadership, myself especially, because I've asked for any inquiries, complaints, issues to be directed to me so that teachers' time is not taken up with trying to respond to that. So I field any of those. So that information goes and that's then fed into the FAQs list that we update regularly on our website and on Firefly. So Firefly is our main means of communication because we're trying to make that a one-stop shop so that all parents go on there and can see everything. Here's the latest news, here's the latest blog, here's the latest information. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, in terms of your links with uh, regulators uh, and official guidance, is there anything, uh, again, which you, uh, you choose to share with your school community? Any advice, any guidance? Uh, and yes, also, sir. go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, it's all right, on you go. Uh, and also, are you uh, requested by local regulators to, to keep a track of uh, travel from not just students, but also staff members and also uh, parents of students as well? We've heard that from a couple of people dialed in that they've been requested to do that. Yes. Well, there will be different requirements depending on the authority, the province, the government that you're working under and depending on your situation. So uh, a part of my job I haven't mentioned that's been added to is report giving. So every day um, I am asked for information by the Education Bureau in Hong Kong. So I have to file that information about any changes. I have to file a weekly report about the movement of children, how many are in Hong Kong, have left Hong Kong, whatever. I also have to make those reports for the company on a regional and a worldwide level. Um, and I have to give reports uh, to other bodies as requested by the government. So the reporting side of it can be quite time consuming. Uh, okay. Now, in, ter in terms of uh, tracking what's happening, uh, yes, we're in the midst of doing that because we've got Easter holidays coming up. And although we're open for Easter, uh, doing study at school for those sitting exams and trying to make up for lost time, there will be a lot of families who are on holiday, teachers, many of them will be on holiday. Uh, and so as a result, we need to keep checking the latest advice because, for example, a lot of families were planning to go to Thailand, but Thailand's just announced that if anyone comes from Hong Kong, they've got to self-quarantine for a fortnight which means they may not be back in school in time. School hoping to reopen. Um, the latest suggestion is 20th of April. So that would affect their coming back. Same with staff. If they go on holiday and find they're in a country that suddenly says, you'll have to quarantine. Or if Hong Kong says, if you're coming now from that country because the number of cases has increased, then you will have to self-quarantine when you come back to Hong Kong. So all of those are difficulties. And it's quite difficult to track all of this because it's such a swiftly changing situation. So these are added responsibilities, if you like, that we've got, and they're not easy to manage. We have uh, various regulations we have to absorb in, uh, and observe sorry, in school. So for example, year 11s are allowed in school at the moment because they have an exam, but they can only be there in small groups. 
Their temperatures have to be gauged as they enter the school. They must wear a mask. They must use sanitizing gel. We have deep cleaning of all areas of the school that they're in. Every time they change class, that class has to be cleaned before the next class moves in. Um, and they have to sign a declaration form that they haven't been in the highly affected areas in the last fortnight. So you can see these are some of the regulations and things like that will be in place in other countries. And if they're not, they'll be coming soon. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, and you've given some superb examples, again, with external partners, how to engage with families, students, uh, and your staff. But what advice can you give colleagues where students and their families do not wish to engage? How do you uh, encourage them? And, and also, uh, is there any um, uh, recourse there for those that do not wish to or unable to engage? online learning well it's two different things isn't it if they choose not to engage then um you have to find out what the reason is so for a small number of parents it can be i'm choosing not to engage because i want my money back and i want it back now uh, because our argument is that we are providing online learning in line with the school day to the best of our ability and I've got to say that in all our surveys, the vast majority, and we're talking 80, 90% of parents, say, thank you very much. I can't believe the work that teachers are putting in to make this work. It's been really great what we've been doing uh, with our children at home. So most parents are really appreciative of the lengths that teachers are going to, because it's not a question of posting worksheets and saying, work your way through these worksheets while the school's closed, because that would be ridiculous to suggest that that was real learning or progress. So if the reason is they want out uh, and they don't want to pay their fees, then I'm saying to them, this is available, this online learning. If it comes to the bit and they don't want anything to do with school, that's their choice. So they can leave, but they do so on the understanding they've lost their place. Um, and that means that when things start back, they may not have a place in school again. So again, this usually pulls people up with a start and think, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, and, and so we haven't, we haven't had anyone actually do it. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of other reasons, uh, we have a family who said they're in a remote part of Ireland and they haven't been able to get back. So we're not able technically to access things as well. Uh, but we've dealt with that remotely. Now they're online and they're accessing the learning. So it very much depends on the reason for them not accessing it. Okay, thank you, Brian. And it, in terms of those youngsters who require additional learning support or mm. e, uh, or, and or EAL, uh, any programs which you think uh, have been really beneficial to your primary and secondary students? Yes, well, we have a very good team. We have an additional support needs team in the school who support any child with any learning difficulty or those who require intensive EEL support. So we already do a lot of work that in the school. So those children know these members of staff well. So they are the members of staff who are dealing with them online. Uh, and we've got the advantage of certain platforms. For example, Century Tech, is a very good platform to use with everyone because the response to the answer is tailored to the child's needs. So if it's shown that this child has particular learning difficulties, then there's a step-by-step -step approach about how you go about it. So um, various platforms are particularly helpful. But the main help is, of course, from teachers themselves because they know the children, they know what works. And the way we operate is that we do in the normal running of the day, set individual targets for children. So we try to ensure that every single child, no matter what learning difficulty they have, has appropriate work. So the work we are giving is differentiated by task or by outcome or by support. Okay, thank you, Brian, very clear. Uh, in terms of the real-time chat between students and teachers, how often uh, would you say that uh, that's actually happening, please? Well, in secondary, it's happening all the time. So all day, every period, um, that chat is constant. But it takes different forms, of course. You know, we're not 
we're not having video face to face. We do it occasionally just to make sure everything's all right. That's more for pastoral reasons than anything else. But because of what I said about safeguarding issues with video in particular, but also because that's not how we teach. So by using the Padlets, we can get more interaction, for example. Everyone can jump in and add what they think of this and discuss it. And also the sharing of screens means that whatever you're working on, whatever you've got up on screen is fine. Now that works well in secondary. That doesn't work so well in primary because younger children may not want the rest of the class to see the work they're doing. They may feel embarrassed or they may feel their work's not as good as someone else's or they may feel as if they're showing off. For different reasons, they're not comfortable with that. So you don't necessarily use that mechanism uh, to share. Uh, but as far as primary is concerned, uh, it, it will vary depending on the activity and depending how easy it is for a child to access it. So quite often, um, primary teachers will get a whole lot of questions at once and then nothing for half an hour. Uh, or they will get questions the whole time and comments on chats the whole time. So it very much depends on the activity and on the child and the family themselves. Because if a number of families decide not to access material until the evening, then obviously a teacher is not on at that time or shouldn't be on at that time to be answering all of those questions. They can do it the next day once they start learning again. Okay, thank you. Uh, in terms of your exam preparation classes, you mentioned students coming into school. What's the yeah. frequency of those uh, visits, please? Well, we've uh, just last week and this week, we've been given permission by the Education Bureau that small groups of our exam students can come into school. So they're in following the normal timetable every day, and this is the second week of it. We've got some support to study after school to help with exam preparation. The bulk of what we're doing is finishing coursework or um, doing practical assessments like um, drama, music, um, getting art ready for the actual practical exam, and of course, speaking tests in languages and English. So they're in every single day. And uh, we've also got uh, groups working on Saturdays uh, to give them a longer run of time on specific subjects or assessments. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I know it's a crystal ball type of question, but some colleagues are curious as well in terms of has it had any impact on the uh, most precious resource of any school, your staff, in terms of retention or recruitment, please? Um, well, it's not had any impact yet in terms of retention because what we've tried to do is keep staff morale up with some of the things that I've mentioned earlier. All our staff are in Hong Kong, so we don't have a problem that some schools have where they were caught in the situation of a lot of staff being on holiday at Lunar New Year and not being able to get back to their schools. So we are not in that position. In terms of recruitment of new staff, well, touch wood, I'm touching my head at this point, touch wood, none of the staff that we've uh, recruited for next year have withdrawn. We have had one or two positions where we were making offers and people have been reluctant to accept, so to accept the offer just now. But that's only one or two instances. And I think that's understandable given that it's happening at this exact moment. Yes. So I think, yes, I think it will have an impact on recruitment and retention. And it's clearly going to be more difficult in different parts of the world because some countries and some schools, depending where they are, already find it quite hard to fill jobs. This is only going to make it harder. Okay, yep, thank you very much. I think that's a shared feeling from, from colleagues uh, across the world. Um, in terms of uh, if I can say, Brian, um, we're, we're drew, uh, due to draw webinar to a close. Um, I'd like to say some final words just to thank your good self. Uh, but Brian, in terms of, I know that the conversations will continue. We're mindful of your well-being. It's 10 o'clock at night almost in Hong <laughs> Kong. Um, yes. So is there anything that you'd like to, to conclude in terms of um, your, your time with us, please? Um, I don't think so. I think, I, well, all I would hope is that by providing this webinar, 
um, we've been able to give you some insight into what's happened in our circumstance and also to prevent people having to duplicate a lot of things. I'm hopeful that some of the material we're giving you and some of the platforms we're suggesting will be useful for schools around the world. I think that's the most important lesson to take from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. And in, in terms of the network, I mentioned before, within Nord Anglia Education, um, we know at the time of uh, this morning when I was talking with Andy Puttuk, Director of Education, there were 27 schools within uh, your group which were, were closed on government instruction. But that's a movable feast. You know, the picture globally is changing. Um, we also know in terms of uh, the resources which are, have been created across your network. Andy suggested there are now two and a half thousand online learning experiences created by colleagues um, within Nord Anglia. And I think it's brilliant. The example you gave before about keeping on sharing across all different uh, social media platforms, the work of the children and the work of the students um, within within our schools. Also, we've had uh, feedback not only from Nord Anglia but from other colleagues as well in terms of the professional development that this has given teachers and professionals and support staff and leaders like yourself, Brian. It's been phenomenal, uh, and people are su suggesting that they've learned you know more through this adversity. Uh, than they could ever have imagined. And again, it's brought colleagues within our network and wider together. Uh, certainly, it is challenging times for the younger children, I think, in terms of their online learning experience. Um, I, and I love the idea that you shared before, and I, I know that some of your colleagues in schools in Vietnam have started up these physical resources um, boxes that are becoming very popular uh, for for parents to either get delivered to their uh, homes or, or collected, just depending on local, just depending on local um, local situation, really. Uh, but you know, I, I'd like to draw it to a close. But before I do, I know we've had a, a couple of questions connected to the COBIS annual conference, which is due to take place 9th to the 11th of May. Now, at this stage, we are uh, planning to go ahead with that large-scale event you know we usually have about 700 odd colleagues who travel uh, to London for that event but clearly like yourselves we are monitoring the situation uh, with uh, with our own internal team but also drawing on regulators uh, government guidance here in the UK but we will share information with you quickly and clearly if that situation changes um, and finally, again, we cannot express uh, the, the words adequately enough, really, to, to signal and to recognize the commitment, tenacity, professionalism of, uh, of teachers and support staff across our network uh, who've stepped up and gone beyond what uh, anyone could have expected. And that goes for yourself, Brian, in your school, your colleagues, colleagues right. within your network and the COBIS network. Um, so please, do everybody contribute to this online uh, COBIS knowledge hub, the COVID-19. Simply search it in the search bar of our website and let's get involved with the LinkedIn group that we've also set up. Again, you can navigate your way to that through uh, the COBIS um, resource. We want it to be dynamic uh, with questions, conversation. Uh, and let's remember, we are here as an organization to help students and schools thrive no matter what location, size, uh, or stage in their development. So thank you, Brian. You have been superb in delivering this webinar and from everybody who's tuned in and who will gain access to this recorded webinar, thank you very much. Thank you, best wishes to everyone. Marvelous.